Okay, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, it's exciting for me to be on this call because even though I'm sitting in Ontario today, I'm actually from Nova Scotia. So it's nice to be connecting with people from my home province. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to begin actually by reading a land acknowledgement. And I like to always pause before reading it to make sure um, that we're doing it with intent and that uh, we're really thinking about the words that we're saying. Um, so, and um, I was really interested, I found a, a land acknowledgement because um, often when giving a land acknowledgement, you're in a specific location, but for, for many of us, um, uh, for me, uh, we're calling in from different lands and the lands you may be on in Nova Scotia. So I really liked this, um, version of the land acknowledgement and uh, I'll take a moment to read it now. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous people of all the lands that we're on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to affirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So thanks again for joining us all today. Um, Really excited uh, to welcome you here. I'm Mark Patterson. I'm the executive director of Magnet. Um, and we are a consortium partner with the Future Skills Center. And one of the big things that we um, realized really early on was many of us are used to uh, applying for uh, different funding and um, trying to bring consortia of people together to apply uh, for funding from the government, different levels of government, provincial, territorial, or federal, to pursue a passion or project to help people potentially connect to work or to support small businesses, whatever it may be. So things usually around workforce and economic development. And I'd always been on the side of applying for uh, funding. Um, and it was interesting, uh, you know, often had lots of things to say about how the process could be better, <laughs> but then all of a sudden found myself on the opposite side um, where we were adjudicating hundreds and hundreds of applications and realizing the challenges um, from the other side. But one of the things that really uh, struck me and stood out for me was, was like, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if that group in Nova Scotia had known this group in BC or this other group in Manitoba? Um, because unless we have an opportunity to connect kind of serendipitously at an event, um, we don't always find people that have the same passion for the same issues and challenges as we have. And so we started thinking like how how could we do this? And, and we know there's a lot of fragmentation in the workforce and economic development system across Canada, um, not for lack of people wanting to work together. It's often the way things are funded. And so we're trying to figure out how could we help people at least connect. And, you know, there are many tools. LinkedIn certainly is a great way to connect to people. There are other tools. But where would, how could we have a platform that would allow people to express um, areas of passion or interest around workforce and economic development? And so we're at the very early stages of developing a tool that we're calling the, you know, the Future Skills Center Community of Practice. We have a lot of partners uh, across the country coming on over the next while, and it is a work in progress. So we're, we're building out additional <clears throat> tools and functionality to address, you know, feedback and make the tool more valuable. But our, our goal, our, our, our kind of desire for this tool is that it will help people connect, will help people convene, and will help us amplify and tell stories about what works and help us learn from each other, which I think is going to be really important. We need to be more efficient with all of the disruption we've all gone through. Uh, a really incredible kind of 18 months of challenges and how we serve uh, people in our communities. 
Um, and we need to find better ways to share and, and help each other become stronger. So it's no technology is ever the, the end all be all solution, um, but hopefully it's a tool in the toolkit that can help uh, people. So would encourage you uh, to look up the community of practice, find other people. Um, we have about a thousand now frontline uh, workers across the country um, that are interested, for example, in helping indigenous youth or supporting people with disabilities or, or different uh, groups that face challenges in the labor market, um, or just learning from each other on, on certain things and best practice. So I encourage you to sign up. You'll find out more throughout the session and really excited to be able to be part of this conversation today. And I am going to turn it over now to Chantal, um, who will uh, introduce the panel and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks Mark uh, for those uh, great contact setting. And, and one of the things that um, Mark and I have talked often about in the short time that we've known each other, um, I say short time, but Mark, I think it's probably back to 2016. <laughs> it was by happenstance at an event that we met um, as an organization, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called On Point. We help people build meaningful careers, connecting their passion to the work that they do. And because of that, we are lucky enough and privileged to work with um, organizations from the post-secondary space, not-for-profits, community economic development agencies, and employers. And so I found that we were able to see and learn from these diverse perspectives, but also see how silos still exist perhaps. And so this project was a beautiful opportunity for us to, to learn from and with those of you, our lovely, amazing panelists, and those of you joining us today and watching the recording in later months who are doing work on the front lines, working to create a better Canada so that everybody can contribute their best self to what their lives and careers can bring. And so without further ado, just give me a little bit here. I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists and then we're going to dive in. And I am so excited for all of you today um, to learn from this amazing group, as am I myself, uh, even just in our brief conversations leading up to today. There were so many nuggets and pearls of wisdom. We only have an hour today, so we can't answer everything. But by all means, please, if you've got questions and you're joining us live, pop your questions in the chat at any point in time. We are monitoring that, both myself and some other members of the team. We will make sure we've got some periodic pauses to bring those to panelists. And we also have some time for Q&A towards the end. But do not feel like you have to wait. If you've got a burning question, please pop it into the chat and we'll, we'll filter it into the conversation when it makes sense. So. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists and bear with me as I do look down to read because they've just got some amazing history and perspective to share with you. I don't wanna mess it up. So not in any particular order other than what's on my sheet, folks. We have with us Matt Martel. Matt, if you wanna give a quick wave. Uh, Matt is the Chief Operating Officer at the Black Business Initiative and he brings with him a background in management, technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation. He enjoys working with groups to troubleshoot challenging issues, leveraging all of the skills and knowledge that he has to be able to support his team, his organization, and the number of partners that BBI does work with. Matt is a passionate um, individual about Canadian entrepreneurship, especially in working to foster and grow minority-led enterprises. I would encourage each and every single one of you, if you're not familiar with any of the institutions or um, organizations that our panelists are currently doing great work within, such as BBI, please, there's information on the website and we'll make sure to populate some links in the chat as we go through to give some awareness to some opportunities. So welcome, Matt. Next up, I have Jill Provo. And thank you, Jill, for the wave. Uh, Jill is a biracial woman from Cape Breton, Uni Cape Breton Island, not Cape Breton University. <laughs> Um, and uh, Jill holds a degree in public relations with two masters in human ecology and education. In her current role, she is the executive director of human rights, equity and inclusion at the Nova Scotia Community College or NSCC. She brings a substantive understanding of the importance of using equity as a lever in ensuring that all tenets of the academic experience are designed to support genuine inclusion. 
Prior to her role at NSCC, uh, or this current role rather, Jill was the Dean for the School of Access, where she was responsible for managing access programs across Nova Scotia with a focus on providing pathways to post-secondary for specifically racialized and marginalized students. So welcome, Jill. Next up, we have Dr. Devin Kroshnik. Devin, I apologize if I mispronounced that wrong. We didn't cover that in our practice session, but welcome. <laughs> Uh, Devin is an immigrant and member of the 2S LGBTQ plus community who leverages their mixed background and their doctorate in psychology to enable individuals and organizations to thrive. Currently, Devin is heading the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee at Proposify, where they are focusing on working top down via manager coaching and bottom up via company wide education. Having lived in several countries and experienced how each cultural environment highlights and suppresses different intersections of identity firsthand, Devin is committed to improving true inclusion. Welcome, Devin. And last but not least, we have Jess Pop with us. Jess, you want to give a wave? Jess is a recent newcomer to Canada who has a passion for youth leadership, development, STEM, and asset-based community development. Currently, as the manager of engagement and partnerships, and the lead for youth initiatives at the Center for Employment Innovation via the Cody Institute and St. Francis, Univers Uni Francis Xavier University. Uh, Jess is committed to Moses Cody's vision of a full and abundant life for all and strongly believes that collaboration, critical reflection and learning and collective action are necessary to create vibrant, thriving and resilient communities. I could not have dreamt of a more equipped group of individuals to lead us into today's conversation. The theme that we're focusing on today is creating a future of work for all. And panelists, I'm gonna open this up with our first question, which is from your perspective, when you think about building future ready communities for all, just talk to us a little bit and set the context of what comes to mind. I'm just going to go here in my order of screen. So Jess, we'll start with you. Sure. Thanks, Chantal. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Chantal mentioned, at the Center for Employment Innovation, we're committed to Moses Cody's vision of a full and abundant life for all and strongly believe in collaboration, collective action, and ongoing learning necessary to create vibrant, thriving, and resilient communities. Those are really the guiding principles that help to inform our work and approaches at the CEI. And so when I think about building future ready communities, I think about what we've learned in partnership with others. Alongside the Nova Scotia Department of Labor and Advanced Education and the Nova Scotia Works Employment Ecosystem, who are collectively striving towards the vision of a robust, productive and inclusive workforce in Nova Scotia, one that really represents and truly celebrates the province's diversity and embraces opportunity and innovation. I think about the longstanding history of St. Apex, Cody and Extension engaging and supporting communities across Nova Scotia and globally. And I think about the work of the CEI staff alongside communities over the last four years. And I'm so immensely grateful for the opportunity to learn and work uh, alongside people, uh, having community members who are sharing their concerns, frustrations, excitements, ideas, perspectives, and questions with us. And it's from those deep and rich conversations where we've seen a number of key factors arise in terms of priorities or shifts that need to be made in order to really build a future ready community. Uh, I won't go into a ton of detail here, but just want to share some of those uh, key learnings. So four ones that have really risen to the top over the last four years. Um, grounding our work in relationships and moving at the speed of trust and really knowing that there's evidence out there that suggests uh, a sense of belonging and community and social cohesion are key factors in influencing the resiliency of communities. I don't think we can underestimate this piece enough. Relationships have the power to transform how we live, how we work, how we study, how we learn, how we create together. Uh, the second one that we've been learning is really shifting away from silos and into coordinated collaborative collective action from the individual to the collective. And that underpins a belief that we're really stronger together and that together we can actually achieve more. Uh, the third key learning that's come up across our work with partners is a shift to strength-based and holistic approaches to supporting people and communities. 
a recognition that everyone has something to offer and contribute, to question the status quo, to work towards creating a more just future for all. And when we intentionally start to shift that narrative and are intentional with our language, it's not that we're ignoring the challenges that are happening, but by prioritizing and understanding what is it that we each have to contribute, what do we know, what do we believe, what do we value, and then using that to secure what we don't have or the challenges that we're hoping to address can really create that powerful change. And I think the last piece that I want to share is really requiring a shift and a recentering the priorities and perspectives of community and engaging in collaborative, transparent decision making. I'm sure many folks have heard the quote, nothing for us without us. And at a bare minimum, building future ready communities requires the co-determination and co-creation of solutions. And I think taking it one step further from our work, we've really learned that uh, in order to ensure community can lead in the identification of challenges, in the identification of opportunities, of solutions, and the metrics for success. And so when we reprioritize that local expertise, when we work together, when we use those holistic approaches to complex solutions, it leads to better decision making. Uh, all of this, though, requires a fundamental shift in how we as institutions, as government, as community members, partner, collaborate, and really, really listen to each other. And so when I think about building those future ready communities, those are some pieces that have come up from the work at the CEI. Awesome, and I'm excited just for us to dig in a little there when we talk around that fundamental shift and what role each of us has in our collective organizations and positioning community. So absolutely putting a pin in it on my end there, but um, let's, we'll continue rounding out what comes to mind. And Matt, um, for you, future ready communities, what comes to mind? What would you encourage us to be thinking about? Yeah, so so I'll start by saying great, great answer, Jess. I, you know, certainly, certainly uh, agree with every single thing that you said. Um, I think uh, for me, one one step, I guess I'll, I'll take it further is is really uh, in the work that we do is we really, really do our best to uh, amplify the importance of uh, full participation from from all communities. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I see in uh, businesses jamming and the Black Business Initiative is um, really a, a strong underrepresentation in in spaces like engineering and computer science, which of course we know are uh, the future of work. And if we're speaking about the future of work in this panel, really from, from my seat, it's important to highlight that lack of participation. So, um, you know, we have, we have programs that, that uh, do kind of help with that. We've had some really great successes with um, something it's called the experiences in program. And so what that is, is it, it engages youth. Uh, one of the last ones we did was computer science. And, and basically we, you know, take kids to Dell and let them see themselves um, uh, on university campus and, you know, in the classroom and get to do some activities. And I, I really think that uh, allowing people to see themselves in those spaces really allows us to participate fully. And um, this year as well, I, I did a couple of things. Uh, like I sat on a, a committee for the, I think it was called the, this maybe Silver Economy Summit. So basically it spoke about uh, seniors participation in in the economy and and just really changing that narrative that you know seniors are here and they want to retire and live a you know slow life by the beach when in reality you know there's a lot of energy there there's a lot of expertise there uh, so so making sure that we're doing what we can to leverage those skills and making sure that everyone is participating uh, is extremely important and, and then finally, I'll just mention the same thing with participation rates, but looking at newcomers and recognizing uh, the extremely important role that they play in the economy of Nova Scotia and, and really how we, how we can make them not only feel welcomed, but allow them to fully use their skills and, and expertise that they do have to help us be innovative and help us um, you know, move the needle forward when it comes to workforces and, and just you know, being more agile when it comes to solving problems. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, I, I definitely just think that that uh, that full participation, I think if we if we have full participation, we, we'd see some amazing things happen. Thanks, Matt. Jill, over to you. Thank you. I, um, I don't know that I have a whole lot to add. I think Jess and Matthew gave really comprehensive 
um, answers. I guess the only thing I will say um, on top of that is for me, this work is, um, it's complex, it's systematic, and it's very, very personal at the same time. So for me, this is about reimagining the way we do our work. And so my approach will always, always be about, um, fundamentally about systemic transformation. And I think if there was ever a time when we, when Canadians need to be Nova Scotians, but Canadians need to be compelled to rally together and really striving for equity, it would certainly be, um, it would be now. We are at a time of reckoning. We have never quite seen in my mind, you know, the impacts of the, on the pandemic on our most marginalized, racialized communities. Oh, all of this. Um, oh, Jill, I think we've got a little uh, lag on. Oh, do I? It was the teeniest, tiniest. You seem to be okay now, though. My, maybe it's my Wi-Fi. Yes. No. Am I okay? You are okay now. Hmm. Sorry about that. I'll just keep going. I'm, I'll be super brief so I can let my internet catch up with me. Um, um, what was I saying? Oh, I've never, the good news is for me in all of this, though, that I've never quite seen the conversations happening around disrupting racism and disrupting oppression um, like we're seeing today. And so I guess for me, it would be um, the sense of this urgency, urgency for change and that it's going to take us all to really um, make this change. I know um, the last thing I'll say, something you said, Jess, I don't even know what it was, but it reminded me of this um, quote I heard from, I don't know if I'll, anyone here is listening knows Bozoma St. John. If you don't look her up, Matt, the BBI brought her here a couple of years ago, actually. She's this really amazing Black American business person and marketing executive. I remember I read a quote by her once where she said something like, why do I, as a Black woman, have to fix it all? There's way more of you than there are of me, and we need some help out here. And I just really love that quote because for me as a college administrator, it really means listening to amplifying, responding to those communities that are most affected to be sure they have access to the skills and learning opportunities they need to flourish. And so we all need to do our part. I need some help out here as well. Um, the last thing I guess, uh, my final point I promise is um, big thing for us thinking about certainly as a college is those on ramps, is those pathways, a lot about digitalization, um, especially during the pandemic, we really have seen this radical shift in the way we do work and thinking about digitalization from the lens of equity and inclusion. There's this um, concept many people here are probably familiar with now called digital equity. And we are talking about that so much as a college. What does it mean to really ensure students have equal access to technology and Wi-Fi, making sure their voices are not silenced or marginalized online? As Matt mentioned, equity in STEM is a big um, area of focus for us institutionally as well. Um, so for me right now, this future of work is really about going out of our way to act with intention, to be gen genuine, to really sacrifice it all to ensure that, um, that everyone is included. So it's about doing different to do better at NSCC. Um, we're all in um, to really make the fundamental changes needed. Um, but we just remember, as, as Bozoma said, we, we need some help out here, friends. <laughs> Over to you, Devin. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Jill. And yes, Devin, please. Let me see if I can pull some strings here together. He's just listening to all of these great things. There were a few that kind of stood out to me where Matt started talking about newcomers and Jill is we need a bit of help where I'm really going. It is so much up to the managers in the business side, the people that make the hiring decisions to help people come in. One of the things I see so, so often, I'm an immigrant myself, is the well, do you have Canadian experience? And then it always gets brought up as you need to have that to really fit in. And it reminds me of this research study so much where there was the strong idea in symphonic orchestras that, well, they don't hire women because women just simply don't play as well as men. And they started in having screened auditions to really make sure, no, no, this is a real thing. The problem was a little bit later, they found that after they had completely redone that, yeah, we're only hiring men. So clearly we were right. The carpet wasn't in there. So what were people listening to? How the shoes of the incoming people sounded? So they still knew who the women were. So it's so incredibly important to really, really learn how you think, the behaviors you're doing, the unconscious biases that go in because we defend our ideas around merit-based hiring and we build those screening processes that make it equal but we don't build them in a way that we actually 
don't have a clue who gets hired. So we still end up with copying the same things we had for the last 50 years and sadly not everybody gets allowed in despite all the best efforts. I think that's a beautiful segue, Devin, um, and, and, and I'm going to stick with you if you don't mind um, as we, we start to talk a little bit around what you've seen work. So from your role in Proposify, and I think, there, again, there was a beautiful segue, but, but please take it where, you, where it makes sense. For you as an employer who's working in this space and has views around creating a future of work for all, what are some of the things that you found have worked well to date and or that you're still exploring in terms of figuring out are they working well so that our employers and, and the audience and audiences can learn and come through that as well but i think there's value for us from an institution perspective there's value i think for all of us in this but but success stories from your perspective what have you seen working so far and maybe a little bit of why a good big question. I'm going to stick to hiring for a little bit where one of the strong shifts I saw in a very short time is really going in into the discussions we're having around hiring where very often we blame the pipeline. Now I'm in the SaaS companies, so software, IT, as Matt brought up, we do see such a lack of applicants there. But how can we ever change it rather than just saying, well, there's nobody there. So we very much love, for example, teaming up with uh, business and, I mean, and offering people to come in, especially teenagers and, hey, work a, week, work a week for us so that they see, oh, I could be here and showing off in the hiring panels that there are women, there are people of other marginalized groups. My face, for example, is big on a lot of stuff because guess what, our, uh, I'm kind of our token trans person in a company, but it makes such a difference in being out there. So one thing that really works is having a much more unofficial DI perspective. So many times we had, we had new hires or people that we were just considering hiring, we got private messages where people were on LinkedIn were out, hey, you are somebody like me who works at the company. How is it really? It's these informal channels that you really need to be super aware of as an employer and also push towards it. Have your people at the company and don't you as the up top hierarchy person push your underlings to do it. That's the worst possible way. Not going to get you anywhere, but you need to be aware that word of mouth gets around and in communities, marginalized communities. That's how we get everything, especially in Nova Scotia where everybody knows somebody who knows somebody and that's how you get your job. Who is being excluded that way? And then going out of your way to talk to those people that are normally excluded. And then even when you get to that point, when you have gone through all the resumes or the interviews, which are super stressful, and you should have them in a panel with people of different backgrounds in the first place. But even then, if you have two people who are kind of equal, you would be probably fine with either one of them. We've basically institutionalized, you take the more marginalized person. Everything else aside, you take the more marginalized person, no questions asked. Thanks, Devin. And again, big questions, big conversations, and really, we're not going to get through everything today. Um, but we do invite folks to join the community of practice. The links in the chat, it will go in later on. The conversations will continue. Um, and we're just going to go in reverse order because that makes it a little bit easier for me on the screen side of things. Um, and, and Jill, I'll ask from your pers perspectives, can you share some, some wins, some success stories and or aha moments along the way? Yeah, hopefully my leg is a bit better here, but I have actually a, a cool one that I that I want to share that I was just reminded of. Um, so we do at the college sometimes back to the point, I think it was Jess or Matt earlier that was talking about, you know, fostering connectivity and fostering belonging and the importance of that. So we have, like everybody, we have different ways we do that. But one cool thing we do is we offer what we call designated programs or designated cohorts of students where every applicant to the program has to be a member of a certain community. So what brought me to NSCC about 15 years ago actually was starting in all black um, at a learning program. We're one of the first in the country to do that. And we've done lots since then, all black um, early childhood education courses, Mi'kmaq early childhood education courses, programs for English language learners, persons with disabilities, persons who are incarcerated. So essentially if you're facing barriers, we wanna help. We wanna provide that solace, that on-ramp. 
But one of them that I really want to share that I have such great pride in, um, especially as a biracial woman, but such great pride in anyway, is a program that we call the 20 for 20 in 2020 group. I don't know if anybody heard of this, Matt, you might have because we talk about it all the time around here. But the 20 for 20 in 2020 group is essentially this. It was an all black Nova Scotian cohort of 20 students who entered into our two year welding diploma program. So high demand career, lots of employment opportunities. The 20 students entered into this two year program. So not a short term, for us that's relatively long um, that is offered through our Irving Shipbuilding Center of Excellence. So check this out. The program began with 20 black Nova Scotian students they essentially bonded like a family. They made a commitment to start and to finish together, to leave no one behind. They weren't letting anything stop them from achieving that goal. And guess what? They did it. I really love this story because it's a two-year program. Like you have to keep that in mind. You know, life happens. Um, the program started in September 2018 with 20 students, ended in June of 2020. That's the other 20 in all my 20s. Pandemic and all, keep in mind, this is the midst of a pandemic with 20 students. 13 of whom achieved honors. So this is the most successful Black Nova Scotian program the college has ever run, 100% completion rate. You can't really um, do any better than that. But to even go a step further on this one, it really warms my heart. This, most of the students are now employed, by the way, at the Irving Shipyards. When you talk Chantel about lessons learned, that partnership with community, that partnership with industry is so critical to the success that we saw in that program. Um, but they also recently reached out to our foundation all on their own to set up a brand new award that they are going to um, help us to find funding for that they have called the Black Empowerment to Success Award that will be for one male and one female student, Black Nova Scotian student attending the Italy campus where this program is offered. So I just wanted to share it as, you know, a shiny example of Black excellence, um, but also how education can be done right in terms of creating belonging, in terms of getting those partnerships right, and the results show themselves in terms of that impacts community in a big way. We're a small community you know, that impacts community for generations. So 20 for 20 in 2020, there you go. <laughs> I think that will be locked in now at this point. That Thank you, Jill, beautiful example. Um, and I think, um, Matt, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to you from your perspective um, and, and to share what comes to mind when you think of successes. Um, and we did have a question from the audience that if this fits, feel free to, to tie in here. If not, we'll come back to it, which was around um, you, you know, you mentioned participation, full participation earlier, um, and the question is around how do how do we, and I guess in a big sense, um, and or as organizations increase participation rates from marginalized communities and and, and programming and employment. I think there's relation there too. So if there's something that that kind of weaves in there from a success perspective, feel free to to speak to it. If not, I, I will park it. And we'll come back to it because I think that's a fairly I think that's something that you probably get asked quite a bit through the work that we've been able to see you do through BBI and, and BIJ. So if you don't mind, I'll put you on the spot a little bit there and then maybe there's something there we can stop, we can talk to. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I, I would say that one, yeah, probably, you know, definitely deserves its uh, own kind of spot, but I'll, I'll just start uh, building off of Jill's, uh, Jill's answer. Because uh, there's, you know, as I was thinking about this, the number of success stories you know, I got my little notes going here and, you know, the list was, was just growing and growing. And, um, you know, something that I talked to about with, uh, with my CEO is just the, the, the work that we could be doing to highlight our successes more. Cause I, I really don't think we pat ourselves on the back enough. And, and that's not a BBI thing. That's a, um, you know, that's a community thing. So, um, you know, building on, on Jill's example, we've, you know, also been part of something called Constructing the Future and the Culinary Journey, two very similar programs, you know, recognizing the gaps in, um, in the participation in the skilled trades, going through a, an, ex an um, you know, a, a stringent program to, to put people in a position where they can become Red Seal uh, tradespeople on the other end. You know, we've seen huge success with that. I, I found my way into, um, into the municipal government through a program called Bridging the Gap. So really great internship program. Um, I, you know, went through Dalhousie through the transition year program. So there are, you know, so many really great programs out there that, um, you know, pave the way for some really, really great success stories. And it's impossible for me to pick one. And I, I think maybe because our workplace, we've got 
we've just got walls lined with success stories, right? So it's it's near impossible to pick one. Um, so, you know, there's lots out there. There's a couple of programs. And then in terms of the, uh, you know, increasing participation rates. Uh, so one program that we launched not too long ago is called Diversity Employment Network, uh, where we help organizations do exactly that. And, and really what we find is that uh, a lot of times organizations will you know, reflect inward, see the gaps, maybe they look around the room and it's not quite how they want it to look. Uh, and then they just say, you know, how do we get more of this? And, and I, I really don't think that's the, uh, the ideal approach, but I mean, it's better than doing nothing. And in reality, I think working with partners is, is really key because one of the things that we do as a starting point is uh, we call it a cultural audit. And, and that looks internally not just you know using our eyes, but looking at um, you know looking at attitudes, looking at how prepared your team is for these um, you know diverse hires that you're looking to do. Because it, it's one thing to get people in the door, but it's a whole other process to hold on to people. Um, and you know, and and we just want to make sure that people are set up for success. Uh, in a in a big picture kind of way. So yes, it's important to get people in the door, but let's also make sure your team is is prepared to hold on to them and and reap the real benefits of having a diverse team. So uh, certainly, whoever wrote that question, I can't see it here on my screen, but I you know I can talk about this uh, for days. It's obviously a, a personal kind of um, passion of mine. So I'd be happy to chat. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. And, and again, so many, it, it's great actually to hear from that perspective. And I think that this is part of the breaking down silos that it's helpful for those of us who are not doing the work in the same way and who maybe don't have the opportunity to see from it and or learn of those successes. But that's really big part of the series here. Um, and so Jess, I'll ask you to fill from your perspective, success stories from what you've seen in your role and your work. And if there's something around participation rates um, that, that makes sense to speak to, by, by all means, I'll open that to you as well. Sure, thank you. And it's so, there's so many light bulbs that are coming up from what folks have just shared around hiring and the questions we're asking ourselves around how we create systems and, and structures of belonging. Um, you know, not celebrating our successes enough. When we first came to the CEI four years ago, that was part of uh, our first few months was driving around the province to meet each of the Nova Scotia Works folks and to learn from them about what are they really proud of and what are they excited about. And one thing that continued to come up in those conversations was we don't celebrate the successes enough. And so as I think about you know, what's working well, I think about a lot of the work that our partners are doing in community, alongside community, really working to break down the barriers that are preventing folks from participating fully in whatever that means for each individual. We know that that's a spectrum of, of how people like to engage and, and what they're hoping for in work. Um, but I, I, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and rather than talking about any of the programs, I want to focus in on, on some of the approaches that we've been uh, using in terms of what I spoke to earlier and applying it to our own team and work. And one of that is really around shifting the power dynamic, especially as it relates to young people. Um, we have a new initiative that's getting ready to launch soon, so this is definitely top of mind. And the, the question is always, you know, how do we avoid tokenism? What does meaningful engagement look like? What do folks have to offer? And so over the last four years, the CEI has been doing quite a bit of work in supporting post-secondary students to engage in uh, leadership, research, and engagement capacities uh, through internships with the center. And we've been learning a ton. There's been really hard lessons. There's been really great lessons. Um, but one of those pieces is certainly shifting the power dynamic and recognizing that everyone has something to offer. Everyone has strengths and assets. Everyone has something to learn. None of us know it all. And so by shifting that and trying to create spaces where anyone on the team at any point, whether they're part-time, whether they're full-time, whether they're students, whether they're full capacity, you know, everyone feels comfortable in bringing up challenges, questioning the ways in which we're doing things and, and contributing in really meaningful ways. Uh, so I want to highlight some of the, the youth-led work that's coming out of, of the internships this summer. Um, we've hosted almost 30 students over the last four years. Uh, we have currently, I think it's 23 students at the department, eight of which are working directly with the CEI and lots of folks who are 
leading work with other young people on topics that are of interest to young people as they think about entering the workforce. Uh, they're learning, you know, do I like research? Do I like asking questions? Do I like hosting community? Do I like the sphere of work around community development and, and career development? Um, but they've been working alongside some wonderful supervisors who are really committed to helping them thrive, succeed, and explore their passions. Um, so we have a number of individuals who are working on um, creating a youth-led, youth-focused learning space to help other young people connect and talk about challenges in the workplace, uh, how they can elevate their own practice, what they can do differently. We have young folks who are exploring research questions like, how can employers better support the mental well-being of young professionals as they transition into the workforce? Um, what practices exist across Nova Scotia and how do we better support more accessible hiring practices for organizations? Um, what approaches are being used and what value does mentorship bring to the workplace for young people? Um, and how do we best support young people to really lean into their true and authentic selves and lead in their spheres of influence and work? Um, so they're creating evidence-informed toolbox, they're rec making recommendations for employers, they're creating frameworks to really help us as an organization but as well as others to better engage in, in the systems that we work within and dismantle the systems that we work within. And so I think that comes back to, you know, when, when communities, and in this case, young people are able to lead, uh, create, a, create and follow through on the ideas that they're coming up with, co-create solutions, the impact of that work can really be transformative. Uh, we're certainly seeing that through our work. The employers that we are talking with and the system partners that we work with are seeing that, and it's about you know, creating those meaningful contribution spaces, ensuring that we're valuing what everyone brings to the table. But again, it's that that when we fundamentally uh, change the way that we view each other, when we prioritize working alongside people as colleagues and collaborators, thinking about our relationships with government, with students, with uh, young people who are entering into the workforce, challenging some of those traditional uh, power dynamics, when we change those relationships, we really start to change the systems. So I just wanted to share some of what's coming out from the incredible young folks that we work alongside every day and, and the way that they're shifting the future of work to create better systems and structures for everyone. Exciting and, and can't wait till till some of that um, is, is maybe made public and available. So we'll follow up, Jess, and then share that with folks in the recap. Um, and, and, and again, there's so much here to talk about. So this will be our final posed question. So audience members, if you're with us, if you've got a question, please feel free to pop it into the Q&A. Um, panelists, if we do have one come through, um, I'll, I'll, we'll switch it up there. But what I would love to spend a little bit of time here as we kind of moving to closing out um, is what do you see as the primary role that each of us has to play in building future ready communities? And this could come in the form of, of advice to others in similar positions to you, to employers, to be those to be employed and or to create businesses themselves. So from your own perspectives, words of encouragement in the role that we have to play in doing our part to build future ready communities. And Jill, maybe I'll start this question with you just to mix it up a little bit. Yeah, sure thing. I'm, I'm going to... Um talk about something here. I hope it's in direct response to your question, Chantel, but something um, I, you know, clearly I have a bias. I work in education. So for me, um, education is, uh, is the easy answer in terms of what we all need more of. Um, but the very quick thing I do want to share that is a pretty exciting thing that is happening here in Nova Scotia is that um, we are essentially in the process right now of building this training. So yes, of course, it's going to be about education that is meant right now, it's being designed for all actually 11 post-secondary institutions in Nova Scotia. However, it's going to be open access. And so who knows what else we can do with this, but Chantal and to the panelists, I really see great opportunity to engage with employers and other folks in this training. And essentially what we've done is there's this table I sit around called the Social Equity Working Group that has post-secondary reps, government reps, and others. Make a long story short, we've done a whole bunch of research looking at Kind of how do you actually go about creating um, at least the educational environments that would be equity centered that would be focused on recognizing and building an equity centered learning and or one could say working environment and we ended up determining that there are two fundamental frameworks that we use in education 
not necessarily always mirroring them together. And that would be Universal Design for Learning, UDL. Many people here have probably heard of UDL. So Universal Design for Learning plus being coupled with culturally responsive practices or CRP. So we kind of say equity-centered environments equals UDL plus CRP, Universal Design for Learning plus culturally responsive frameworks. So we did a whole bunch of research and found out nothing really that brought those two together in a meaningful way exists that we could find actually internationally. And it's being built right here in Nova Scotia. So I hired a consultant about a year ago as part of this table. It's in full swing. We are developing the content. The e-build is starting this summer. We're going to have a big equity summit in November where we'll officially kind of launch the modules. They're going to have ASL interpretation. We're going to translate them into French. We really want these to be um, quite accessible. So I share all that just simply to say, this is a pretty big, cool thing that we have going on here in the province, but we want to make it even bigger, um, getting more partners involved and more people across the country engaged. So I would say to people that are interested, stay tuned, more training, lots of opportunity to learn more about how to create these equity-centered um, learning and working environments coming your way soon. Awesome. Tentative date in the calendar for November. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Jill, for that so much. Um, Devin, from, from your perspective, when you think about words of wisdom, advice, so to speak, and, and, and I'm absolutely going to, you know, encourage from, from, you know, for our employers, for those that are on the hiring side of things, um, some, some key words of wisdom and or advice or things to consider when you think about the role employers have in building future ready communities where all can participate. I'm going to lean fairly heavy into another piece of research here that we've only this year got out of um, Western University where they looked at how do you actually get a culture that supports everybody in the workplace. And yes, education is important, but what education primarily does is make people willing and able to speak up when they see something. But you need to build on top of that. So once the education is in, the three big things that we know work is policies, the thing no one ever likes, because we all want to believe in a world where everybody is going to be inclusive just because it's the right thing to do. Sadly, it isn't going to work. So you need to have the policies in place to support it. Then you need to have manager involvement because policies only work if everybody up top and in the middle is pushing on every single team. So everybody needs to be on board. And that's where people like me, for example, I work with every manager we have in the company individual to make sure that the policies are known and people are following them and there is buy-in. So half the individual coaching part to it. And then the third thing is mentorships and sponsorships. It's especially important in Nova Scotia and even more important to work with people that don't normally get access to these networks that we're having, newcomers and marginalized groups that have been here in Nova Scotia for a very long time, but still aren't part in it. So if you have any kind of power or privilege, even if it's just a little bit, or you are not fully sure if you have it, go out and use it. It's a strength you have that you can bring to everybody. So just to reiterate, policies, manager involvement, sponsorships and mentorships. Awesome, thanks Devin. I think again, some, some really good things that we'll follow up with some of our panelists on so we can provide some of these resources and, and share uh, so that we can really allow for the audience and the community to digest them and, and engage in, in questions in the community of practice. Um, Matt, from your perspective, what comes to mind? Yeah, so I, I want to just build on uh, Devin's point uh, where um, where they said get out and use your power. Very similar to my uh, my thoughts is really for the people on the call is I just encourage you to you know dig into the problem and and really whatever your strengths are just kind of you know double down on what it is that you do well and and use that strength to make a difference. So. I, we get calls all the time and I have conversations with all the time and, and people kind of feel like, you know, okay, how can I, how can I shift what we do to, you know, to make these changes or how do I change as a person and all those types of things. And, and while obviously we can grow, I think one of the biggest benefits is to take what you do well and, and use it for, for this issue. So, um, you know, if, for people who don't know where to start, obviously finding partners who do is an extremely, extremely important uh, part no matter what that is I, I feel like 
when when it comes to say accounting you know we know where our, where our line is drawn and and we can't do this so we find an expert uh, and and i think there's some things that we're a lot more comfortable seeking help on than this and and maybe it has to do with vulnerabilities um you know and and kind of opening up the closet to the whole um you know everything that's going on in the organization and and some of the challenges and and there's some vulnerability there so um you know everyone starts somewhere recognize that and and reach out to your partners and then finally i guess i would say um or i guess two things one is also make sure to invest uh, time and money i know it's it's challenging and i think a lot of organizations uh, you know feel that it can be done without a, a financial investment but i think a lot of times uh, it, it really does and and that's something you have to accept and it has to be done in a way that's manageable for your business. Obviously, you know, we don't want anyone to go out of business doing these types of things, but but there need it, there needs to be a line item for for this work or, or it's not going to happen in your organization. Uh, and and then building on what I said earlier about uh, the cultural audit process that we do, I think it's also extremely important for organizations to start working on your support system for your new workforce now. Uh, before you have them. So whether that's training, whether that is uh, inclusion efforts, whatever it is, um, because we are entering a new workforce, even if they don't look different, we're dealing with new types of work. And I think it's important that we build those supports uh, before we need them. So many nuggets. Um, but uh, Jess, I will thank you, Matt, for that. And, and Jess, I will I'll pass the floor to you for to close us out on, on this question. And then when when you are finished sharing your take on the question and advice from how we can all engage in this, Mark will join us again just to give a couple words of, of thanks and uh, close out our session. And that's how quick these go, folks. So I will um, we'll put the link to the community of practice in the chat as well again there. But before we do close out, Jess, final words, at least for this time, over to you now. <laughs> sure, thanks, Chantel. Um, you know, in terms of roles, I think and I, we've talked about this already, everyone has strengths and assets uh, to be able to create the systemic and systematic change that we need to see to create a future of work that is really inclusive and supportive of all people across Mi'kma'ki and Nova Scotia. Um, I think part of it is figuring out what is your niche? What are you passionate about? What are you interested in? What do you have to offer? Uh, so not so much words of advice, but questions like what you know, what are your values? What do, how do you want to show up and support yourself, support the people around you? Uh, where do we each need to grow, to learn, to unlearn? Uh, what systems do we benefit from? Uh, what systems are preventing and systems of oppression for others? How do we dismantle that? How do we do this together? Lots of questions. What do we do? What are, how are our systems and policies aligned? Um, yeah, continuous curiosity and learning to figure out how we can proactively examine and change our policies, our systems, and approaches to better support people as a whole. Uh, so I think I'll leave it there. Folks covered lots of pieces that, that certainly resonate as well, and I'm uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Jess, very much. Mark, I see you've joined us. Perfect timing. I will pass it over to you for remarks um, and closing us out. Yeah, thank you, Chantal. I think, uh, like everybody, based on the comments, I've really enjoyed the conversation and have learned a lot. And I like, Jess, your last comment, you know, continuous curiosity and learning. And um, I think it's really important, like, that we learn from e each other, uh, share what works and doesn't work, not... Uh, you know, have to necessarily learn the same, you know, we can certainly learn from failure, but uh, um, we also need to learn from each other's um, attempts and what worked and what didn't work. So that's our hope with the uh, community of practice. We know, like I said early on, it's, a, it's in early stages, we're still developing, we want to hear from you, what's valuable, what would be more valuable, but to have a place where we can find each other, um, to find people with the same passions and and uh, figure out how we can collaborate more effectively, how we can work together, I think is really important as well. So appreciate everybody's time today. Um, also, if you are not aware of the Future Skills Center, make sure you learn more. Um, 
uh, currently funding around 130 projects across Canada, all on workforce and economic development issues. And a lot of our focus with the Future Skills Centre, um, over 50% of the investment is focused on underrepresented groups and, and evidence-based policies that uh, we can pursue to have real meaningful system level and systematic impact on those issues. So learn more about the Future Skills Center, check out the Future Skills Center community of practice and um, thank you everybody for your time. I know we're all zoomed out on a million meetings. So um, it's, it's nice to see so many people on the call today. Um, and I'm sure you have another meeting to run to as I do. So thank you all for your time, everybody. Take care.